Rock and Roll Geek Show 922. Still rocking after all these years. This is the story of my rock and roll butler. This is it, the show that started it all. Often imitated, but never equal. From San Francisco, USA, online since 2004. It's the one and only Rock and Roll Geek Show. With the original rock and roll geek, Michael Butler. Welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. My name is Michael Butler. Thanks a lot for joining me. I really appreciate it. Today is Friday, July 19th, 2019, and it is 6.39 p.m. when I'm recording this show open. Yesterday, I did an interview with, well, let me back up a little bit first. Um, the Butlers had a couple of gigs in Los Angeles over the weekend. We went down and um, played with Mick Cripps's band, Mick Cripps and Nigel Mogg, Nigel Mogg from the Choir Boys, Mick Cripps from LA Guns, played with their band called The Brutalists and a couple other bands, um, Joe Normal and another band called The Claws. All the bands were great. We had a great time. So anyway, on the way back, I was in the back of Craig's truck and I got a... Uh, <clears throat> A message popped up on my phone from a friend named Patty, and it was on Instagram. It was an Instagram direct uh, net direct message or something like that, and it said, "Hey, um, I know you're a podcaster, and or something something to that effect." She didn't say podcaster, but I know you're in you do podcasts, and you're maybe you can help Handsome Dick Manitoba. And she sent a link to his post, and it was Handsome Dick Manitoba said something to the effect, "Handsome Dick Manitoba from the Dictators, rock and roll." legend if you everybody who listens to the show knows about handsome dick anyway he said hey i have a podcast and i haven't been able to upload any episodes for several months now and i don't know what's going on can somebody please help me and so patty had sent me a message and and linked to that so i responded well i can do my best to help or something to that effect and i got a direct message like right away from handsome dick manitoba said, hey, if you could help me, it'd be great. I'd really appreciate it. Here's my phone number. And so I got in touch with Handsome Dick. <sighs> Slow down, Butler. I'm getting excited talking about Manitoba because I'm such a huge fan of the dictators, as you, pro- as, you as most of you probably are as well. Let me slow down, take a sip of this fine Modelo, second one of the day. Ah. <clears throat> so... We arranged a time. I said, well, I'm, I'm on the road, coming back home. Um, let's c- call me on Monday. So he called me on Monday on my phone, which uh, I feel like Eddie Trunk saying this, but he did. And we spent about two hours trying to get him up to speed on, on getting his podcast uploaded, trying to figure out how to do it. Fortunately, he has a Libsyn account, and I have a Libsyn account as well, so I knew how to upload a show. So we got one of we got his latest episode posted. Oh, well, first, and when I found out Handsome Dick Manitoba had a podcast, first thing I did was subscribe because uh, Handsome Dick Manitoba and a podcast, what's not to love, friends? The guy's got so much fucking charisma and one of the greatest front men of all time. So I subscribed immediately. Listened to about four episodes on Monday when I was at work. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I listened to the Bob. He interviewed Bob Gruen on episode one, and I listened to um, both episodes of the Lenny. He interviewed Lenny K and, and some other stuff as well. Anyway, so we got his podcast working on Monday, and we and after we got it up, the latest episode uploaded, we're just talking, you know, just shooting the shit, and he starts talking about um, the dictators and this and that, and I said, hey. Um, would you possibly consider being a guest on my podcast, the Rock and Roll Geek Show? And he said, absolutely. Since you're helping me, I'm happy to help. So, last night, I interviewed Handsome Dick Manitoba on the Rock and Roll Geek Show. So that's what I'm going to play for you today. Talked to him for about a little bit over an hour last night. Started off, you know, wanting to get into the history of, of the dictators and things like that. Handsome Dick took over, (laughs) took it in his direction, so all I could do was hold on 
for the ride, <laughs> as so they as they say. So I hope you enjoy this. Me and me and handsome Dick Manitoba talking, talked a little baseball, talked a little bit about his relationship with the dictators, talked a little bit about his bar Manitobas, a little bit about his serious show, a little bit about his podcast, and just a little bit about rock and roll as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for the donations. I'm not going to thank everybody personally tonight, but I will thank you on the next episode. I'm heading up to the mountains at four. I'm waking up at three in the morning. I'm going up to, to the house in the mountains. We got the house. <laughs> Hallelujah. We got the place up in the mountains. I'm going up to pressure wash it tomorrow morning. I'm leaving at 4 a.m. So to pressure wash the house. So I can't wait. Can't wait to get up there in the mountains and just uh, see what it's like. See if it hasn't been robbed or anything like that. So where was I? Oh, yeah. Thank you for the donations. Please keep the donations because without your donations, this show would die a horrible, putrid, stench-filled death. And I, but I would like to thank one person in particular. When I was at uh, on the Friday Butler show, we played in Tarzana, California. Both lineups, uh, all the bill played two nights. We played first night in Tarzana, California, and the second night in Pasadena, California. Uh, Scott Jones used to work for for me on, when I was running the team at Mevio. He was, he worked with me, Scott Jones. He showed up. My good friend Joe Klein and his friends showed up, and I was standing there just talking to some people, and a guy walks up to me. He said, "Hey, uh, you don't know me, but my name's Brad Schultz." I'm a, I listen, I never miss an episode of the rock and roll geek show. Here's a, here's a donation. And he handed me a hundred dollars cash. <laughs> so thank you, Brad Schultz for that hundred dollars cash. I really appreciate it, friend. That was very, very, uh, what, what's the word? I guess, uh, <clears throat> great to see. <laughs> Just, it's always great to see, um, Friends of the Rock and Roll Geek Show show up when I'm out of town. And it seems to happen quite often, believe it or not. I can't believe it myself, but it happened. Thank you, Brad Schultz, for the $100, and thank you for listening, friend. I hope you stick around for more. All right, thank you, everybody, for donating. I'm going to shut my mouth now and go right into the Handsome Dick Manitoba podcast. Oh, or not Handsome, no, the Rock and Roll Geek Show, talking to Handsome Dick Manitoba, who has a podcast called You Don't Know Dick, the Handsome Dick Manitoba podcast. And friends, I'm not shoot, I'm not bullshitting. This, this podcast is great. I don't promote many podcasts on the Rock and Roll Geek Show, but this one is good. I love it. It's my new favorite. And we t- he's got a solo album. Uh, he's... He finished a solo album. He's hoping to get a record deal and have it come out. I hope it comes out. But he sent me a few songs. So I'm going to uh, play one of those songs after the interview. Before I go into the Handsome Dick, it reminds me, I'm going to play something from The Dictators NYC. You know that uh, Andy Chernoff wrote most of the songs in The Dictators. Um, well, he's not in. he wasn't in The Dictators NYC, but um, Handsome Dick wrote this one. And it is called Supply and Demand. I'll play this song. We'll go right into a conversation with Handsome Dick Manitoba. Their heads and he deeper in the sand. We sat back 
Handsome Dick Manitoba, um, it's an honor to have you on the show. You know, welcome to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. Well, it's an <laughs> honor being on the show. Well, you say that you're not a legend, but um, I think you are a you're a rock royalty, as they say. So, thank you for coming on. Hey, um, let me ask you a baseball question to start off with. Do Yankee fans? What do Yankee fans think of San Francisco Giants fans? Well, first of all, whenever anybody asks me a question about um, a group of people, I, I can't answer it. I can only answer for myself. You know, like there's like 70 billion Yankee fans, and you're asking me, what do I think they think? <laughs> well, it, well, in San Francisco, when Dodger fans, you know, uh, like the Giants fans can't stand the Dodgers. So I understand. But you have to understand, in New York, when there were three teams, there were Giants fans, yeah. plenty of them. But the Dodgers-Yankees made the Red Sox-Yankees look like lovebirds. It was all about the Dodgers and the Yankees. And it wasn't that the Giants didn't count. The Giants hated the Dodgers, National League. It was like that hate. And then there was like World Series hate. You have to remember, when I was a kid, I come home 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a World Series game on. And there was 10 teams in the league. And the first team went to the World Series against the other first team out of 10 teams. And then, just like in boxing and UFC, they had to add, you know, junior welterweight, welterweight, super welterweight. There used to be a welterweight. Now there's three titles around welterweight. There used, there's like 18 playoff games now. Because you have to get everybody has to have a belt, <laughs> right? So, do you like the Giants or you hate the du Giants or you don't give a crap? I'm an Oakland Raiders fan. You are because I would think the Raider. Or the, oh, you're a Raiders fan. I'm talking about baseball. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm not stupid. I, know. I just just to show you that I'm a fan of one of the teams of that yeah, area. Yeah. Do I? Am I a San Francisco Giants fan? There are there are. Teams I can't stand, and then there are teams that like like whatever, and they're one of the one of the whatever teams yeah, to okay. me. You know, I got it. I got it. Uh, I might have hated them um, if I remembered them playing in New York when I was a real little kid. So, uh, and I always loved you know Willie McCovey and Mickey Mant um, and Willie Mays. You know, when I was in San Francisco, uh, my friend Bob Duncan he took us around town, took us down the world's winding his street and then we saw mccovey cove and you know like i'm a baseball fan like man those guys were great juan marichal one of the best pitchers i ever saw yeah they're a, i don't i don't hate them they're okay. one of the teams i don't hate they're just one of the teams yeah you don't care because they're um they're national league so you so I, I, no but it's, it's 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 like the minnesota twins if they play the yankees they hate them Right for that yeah. time, but during the season, I don't hate the Minnesota Twins. I don't hate, uh, you know, I'm not a big Cleveland Indians fan. They they get on my nerves in a few playoff games, <laughs> but um, the Giants, you know, like the Dodgers, I'm supposed to hate, but I'm such a Sandy Koufax fanatic. My son's middle name is Koufax. Look at this: the Yankees have first inning bases loaded, nobody out. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, you're watching the Yankees <laughs> game right now. All right, you can give me the play well, by play. Well, that's double header because we got rained out. It was like Miami torrential rain last night. Yeah, the Giants played a double header on Monday. So I'm a Giants fan, obviously, because I'm in San Francisco. So I used to be a, a Braves fan when I was a kid. I know you don't care about this, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I was a Braves fan when I was a kid. Uh, Phil Necro was my guy when I was a kid because uh, it was Phil Necro and Hank Aaron when I was a kid. Yo, that's a knuckleballer, Phil yeah, Necro. That's right. That's right. So anyway, I used to like this guy. You're not going to remember him, Wilbur Wood. Nope, I don't know who he that was, is. They they called him a portly knuckleballer in the Chicago White Sox. 
he he has started both ends of a double header. Wilbur Wood. Oh, nice. He his record was like one year was like twenty two and twenty. He started like sixty five games. Yeah, that was back in the good old days when baseball players actually played a lot. When men were men and sheep were scared. Exactly, exactly. So anyway, when you started off, the, I don't know if you hope you don't mind me taking a little bit back. When you started off with the Dictators, you weren't you weren't in the band when they started, right? Were they called the Dictators then? Yeah, well, we went through a bunch of names that we like messed around with, and uh, when we hit the Dictators, it was like a light bulb went off, and I was you know best friend of the band. So I had to have a job. So they gave me a job, quote unquote job. And, and uh, you know, I didn't do too good of a job as a roadie. I, I was drunk and stoned and I lost stuff and I broke stuff. And um, eventually people started saying, you know, you should let Richard sing a little more, Andy, because, you know, he would sing at the end of, of a show and it always got the best reaction. Like Andy just, you know, isn't a very charismatic person. Yeah. So his songs might have been written, well written, but you know, somebody's got to bring it to the people with, with, with a special something. And that was me. It's like, and I didn't know it was me. I never, I never planned on it being me. Uh, you know, that's the magic of life sometimes. How old were you when that, when you were the roadie for the dictators? Uh, about 19, 20 years old. 19, was that like 1973 or something like that? Yeah. Yeah, around there. 73, 74. Then, like, we played this place, Popeye Spinach Factory in Brooklyn, and uh, Chris Stein was there from Blondie, and uh, Eric Emerson from the Magic Tramps was part of the Andy Warhol crew. And as the years go by, more and more people were there. If, you know, it was one of those stories. And, uh, I was a drunk roadie, got up, sang Wild Thing at the end of the show, and it was the biggest reaction. So eventually, um, like my partner now, who I never got along with Andy, uh, John Tiven, my partner now, um, he saw us play with the Stooges, and he said, you know, you should really let Richard be the lead singer. And, um, you know, Andy and I really started not getting along after a while. He just... uh, he never respected me. He never respected my work ethic. Even back then? Um, no, I, I, there was a while where it was wonderful. There was a while where we were just getting stoned, getting laid, playing rock and roll, traveling, you know, getting drunk and just having fun. That lasted for a couple of years, I guess. But I don't think deep down inside, and I, I don't care if anyone disagrees with me, this is just my feeling my feeling is that he never took too kindly to, to me being the, the man. And honestly, it turned bad. And I got to give him more. I got to blame him more because I always thought we made a great team. He was tall and lanky. I was short and stocky. You know, I was very emotional. And I'll tell you anything about my life, wore everything on my sleeve. He was completely shut down and hidden. You know, it was like, and I thought together it was so yin yang that it made a great 360. Oh, fuck yeah. He struck out the sides after he had the bases loaded. <laughs> what inning That's is it? Man. What inning is it's it? It's the Yankees that, it's a double header. It's the second game against the second place team. What inning are Tampa we in? Tampa Bay. Oh, it just started. It was the first inning. Oh, okay, plenty of time. But they, they're doing one of those things where they have, they're starting a relief pitcher for two innings. And another relief pitcher for two innings. They're doing that. Yeah, that's the new thing um, now. The new thing when you're short. So, so you know, it, it became the where uh, people say, you know, and he'll say, you know, it never really bothered him. But how could it not bother when you write the songs and you're in control of everything? And and this other guy is like, it's like one of those things where like everyone knows the lead singer. Everyone thinks I wrote the songs. So I became that important to the perception of who the band was and how could that not bother them? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, a a, a few years later, things just got worse and worse and worse until they got like 
about as bad as you can was, get. <laughs> was Andy always considered like the the leader of the band, or was just like everybody equal parts? Was like more of like you know? No, Andy is, is a control freak. Um, the thing is, you write the songs, you get paid for your songs. Everything else is everything else. Like, but he thought he owned the air rights of the dictators. And what happened eventually was we started Dictators NYC. Yeah, I went to because, that show uh, in San Francisco. Now, it wasn't one of those bands like that would go to like the Temptations, which had no original members or <laughs> one that went to Vegas. We had me, 45-year lead singer, Ross the Boss, star guitar player, 45-year yeah. guitar player. From the Dictators. Drummer. The drummer, JP, we never had a drummer more than three years. He was a drummer for 20 years. We got, we got Daniel Ray, who was playing with Ronnie Spector and wrote with the Ramones and wrote, produced Ramones albums. And he was also guy, in Wild Kingdom, right? Wasn't he in Wild Kingdom? He was in Wild Kingdom for a while, yeah. And then we got Dean Risper, who played with Murphy's Law for a while. He was an amazing guy. One of my favorite people in the world, and a super great bass player. So that's you know we changed it around a little. Andy said, "I don't want to do the dictators anymore." So in other words, in his mind, that means the dictators are over. Yeah, can't do it so without me. Thought. Say, I'm sorry. He thought you can't do it without me. So I'm I'm. No, sending... but he wanted us to change the name to like Bob's, you know, right? Yeah, uh, plumbing service. Handsome Dick and so, the uh, and the boys or something. Yeah, he told he told me the last thing he ever said to me was, "You stole money from me." Huh. Now his mommy died. How did you steal money from him? What? How did you steal money from him? Well, because the dictators NYC. Oh, you did. Many gigs. many people in the world were thought of as the dictators. Right. So he figured you were doing. And, well, he had the option. He had the option to play with you guys, right? Yeah. As, yeah, as the dictators, all the dictators in NYC. Yeah. And like I said, his mommy died, left him a lot of money from selling a house. And, uh, and what he did was he went to these lawyers and um, threatened to sue us, which we couldn't afford. So we had to change the name. And, you know, names are very important in this day and age. Um, so I forget he, what you call it when, uh, not a name, but a, a brand. Yeah, like, trademark. like the brand of the dictators or the dictators NYC is worth a lot more than the brand of Manitoba NYC. So when that plummeted, the band, everyone said, okay, I'm out of here. And that was the end of it. So he, for all intents and purposes, thousands and thousands of people that were getting joy out of watching us play live and looking forward to us, uh, couldn't anymore because Andy had money. If he never... If his mother was still alive, he wouldn't have that money. There's no way in the world he's going to spend $30,000 suing us. I wonder why he doesn't want... So this happened after you guys did... You guys, I think you guys did... I don't know, did you do more than one tour as Dictators NYC? Oh, damn, yeah. We did two, three-week tours of Europe for like six years okay. straight. I think you might have only came and, to San and Francisco And a few tours once. of America. Oh, you did? Okay. I saw you... I saw you once in San Francisco. I thought that was the only time Dictators NYC came to San Francisco. I no, saw we did like two, two or three of America, and then like, like for example, we'd go out April and October, three weeks each for Europe, and we did great in Europe. So he got money, and then he said, "No more dictators." So you got no more dictators NYC, which he probably real. I mean, if you got a lawyer, you probably could have won. But is it really worth it? We're making that much money to fight him. I mean, you probably weren't making. A shit, uh, probably in Europe, you probably made right. a shitload of money, but not in the Let United States. Let me put States. it this way. I was met, it was enough extra money to make my year easier. Uh, right, yeah. Okay, so it did count a lot to me. And to spend that money on a lawyer, everybody would have to chip in. And then... Yeah, it's not worth it. He had you money. You could win, to... you could lose. It could be frozen by the judge. Anything yeah. could happen. I wonder what he gets out of you guys not I mean not letting you guys I guess he figured it's his baby and if he can't if he doesn't want to do it he didn't want anybody to do it which Well exactly he doesn't he, he doesn't want it to be confused with the dictators 
He said, you, you're not allowed to use my picture. I mean, he's not the best looking guy in the world, but <laughs> yeah. so like, why would I use his picture? His picture is like a negative, right? Like, well, you know, the band, the band looked cooler. I thought, be honest with you. I'm not just saying this to be a mean guy. The band played, it was a better band. It was a better, it was like Ross, I'm singing better than I ever did. Ross is playing guitar better than I ever did. This guy's a much, much better bass player than, than uh, Andy. Right. Um, <laughs> Daniel, you know, as, as far as technically, Scott's a good guitar player, but he can't sing for shit. And Daniel could sing real good. And Daniel understood the music. That's the important thing. And Daniel, so he fit in. And Daniel Ray can write good tunes, too. Yeah, but we wrote one new song, and uh, me and Ross, and it got really good reaction. So didn't, that was the first song I, I ever wrote. Didn't Daniel Ray write a bunch of tunes off of uh, on the Wild Kingdom album too? Or was that all? So. Was that all Andy? Andy, Andy, wrote oh, Andy. Right. You know, Andy has a new song he just released. Have you heard that? Oh, really? No, I don't. I pay no attention to him because I'm wondering why he doesn't want. You know, he said he didn't want to do it anymore, but then he cuts. He starts recording again. Maybe he just did that. No, he really wants to do what he wants to do. He right. he's like embarrassed. Like he wrote some song years ago about, "Hey, let's get the band together," and like making fun of it. it even though they made more money, even though we played better than the Dictators ever played, had more crowds than the Dictators ever had, and you know, did better in every way, shape, and form than the dictators ever did. But he wanted to stop it, so it had to stop. So then he went and made fun of the band getting back together again when the band was a much better band. <laughs> yeah, I saw that the show I was at was great. I actually snuck a tape recorder into that show and taped the show. I probably have a recording somewhere on my computer somewhere here. I've not listened to it, but it was a great show. And it was packed, too. Normally, the Dictators played at the bottom of the hill in San Francisco, and Slim's was a bigger venue, and the place was packed, and it was a great show. Yeah, bottom of the hill's cool, cool club too. Yeah, yeah, I liked Dictators NYC. It was a lot more. Um, it seemed to be more of a, a powerhouse band. Although I, I love the Dictators too, so I can't. You know, it's hard to compare. But uh, it just was. It just, you know, it just. Andy and Scott just aren't the most. You know, so whatever, whatever they have, they have a, they have their talents, but you know, you come in live, and uh, it was just a better live act. You so, know? so Scott sounded Kemp better, it looked better. So Scott Kempner didn't want to do the Dictators any anymore either. Um, I don't know what's wrong with that guy. I think he's he's got some sort of illness or something because I've known him since. This will blow your mind. 55 years. since fourth grade. Since we wow. were 10. And he came up on stage with us. And he said, this band is so great. They should keep their name. I don't want to have anything to do with going to court or suing them. I don't want any money from them. They're a great, great rock and roll band. And they should go on as is. And then months later, I was talking to him outside in front of my bar for about an hour and we had a wonderful old friend conversation and the next thing i know he wasn't answering any correspondence from me and my lawyer said to me he's gone to the dark side <laughs> which means so he... i was like he's gone he's gone to the to andy it was three against one he went to andy's side everything he said which i have in print about how great we are and we should never be changed and he would never go against us. He completely did. You guys are so all, I, yeah, you, yeah. Guys, you guys are all about the same age, right? Well, Andy's a little older. Me and Scott are like a week apart. Ross is like three weeks apart. You know, it, yeah. I guess the answer is yeah. At, but 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 the thing is to finish the thing about about Scott, it's like what happened? So somebody said to me, You said something about Scott's band sucking. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't remember saying his band sucks. Oh, the Del Lords. And I the Del my, Lords. I thought, yeah, Del Lords. And, and, I, and I thought to myself, wait a minute. First of all, I don't remember that. Second of all, if I said his band sucks, and I know this guy 55 years, and he's never going to talk to me again, I'm like, That's, there's something mentally ill with this guy. There's something wrong with him. 
Like to not come over to another grown man that you were in fourth grade with and just go, what the fuck, man? Why the hell, why'd you say that? That's really hurtful. Like, you know, there's plenty of ways to, to like make up. I mean, if I did, I don't even remember saying it. The point is, what could I have done after 55 years right. well, is, that he's never going to talk to me again? So well, recently he sent some email to me and I, I ignored him, you know, because after like a year and a half, I ignored him. See, there's this money held up. This company that collects money and and it's been frozen and uh, I even got in a fight with Ross about it, but that's for another you mean, another uh, show. You mean I guess dictators royalties. It's it's um, sound exchange. It's right, called. right. Got they it, collect. Got it, got they it. collect. Yeah, like yeah. if you play yeah. on a song, right? Yeah. Like Richard, name all the songs you played on. Ross, name all the songs you played yeah, on. Mechanicals. So what they did was was was. Um, they gave us three hours of a, a mediator for free, and we had to pay for the mediator. So um, the mediator called me, and he said, well, what's your take on the situation? And I said, well, basically, I'd like the money, but, you know, if we're going to do it straight up, and let's say I played on only a certain amount of songs, and someone's getting $7,000, and I'm getting two, I'm not going for that deal. And see, the way that company works is, I mean, that's the way they work. They collect money per song per person. Right. I'm not telling them to change. I'm saying once they give us the money, we could split it up. You know, Andy Sheeran is the kind of guy. I, I'm working with a guy named John Tibbon. He's a brilliant musician. He's worked on 60 albums. He, works, he plays seven music instruments. I went down to his house. There's a home studio he worked on Wilson Pickett's record. He worked on, he's, he's friends with, uh, um, um, what's his name? Steve Cropper, a genius, you know? And you did your solo album he, with him. Yeah, but he didn't charge me. Like in, in the contract we signed with each other, I don't charge Richard for any of my playing. I don't charge Richard for any of my studio. Andy Chernoff is a guy who did studio work for the dictators. And like, I got, Ten thousand dollars to play three songs for the Little Stevens of the Grand Garage Festival in two thousand four. I got ten thousand dollars. That's pretty good. To, so we we should have split it twenty five hundred each, right? Andy said, "I'm still owed thousands of dollars for producing from years ago, and he won't do it unless he gets five thousand dollars." So this, he also said, so "He the, also said, listen to this. I won't play." If you mention the name of your bar on stage, what I said, Andy, I feed, I feed, <laughs> so help me God, I'm my, I'm my mother's stone. He said, he said, I said, boy, Andy, what if I just say one thing, like, hey, after party at Manitoba, I said, I feed my kid like that. He goes, no, you're not going to focus. You're not going to focus. It's like he's trying to tell me to do it. So I had a, a brainstorm. I got my ex girlfriend and all her girlfriends. I got, uh, uh, what's his name who passed away on the used to be an underground garage um, uh, Kim uh, Fowley Kim Fowley who Kim Fowley yes thank you Kim Fowley I got Big Pussy all the guys from the Sopranos every single one of them said Manitobas Manitobas and they all wore <laughs> Manitobas t-shirts and we all talked about Manitobas I said, except me I didn't I didn't mention it and uh, he was really pissed off and my attitude was you know I stole money from him but meanwhile, he broke up a band that he decided was the dictators that three of the five guys in the dictators wanted to do. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, so he took just, five, uh, it, he took five grand from that gig and you guys had to split the other five grand. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise he wasn't going to do it. And huh. I can't mention the dictators. I mean, I can't mention, you can't mention Manitobas. Um, Manitobas. Yeah. Huh. So he did all that. And basically, listen, I've been in enough relationships and friendships to know he can call me crazy. I can call him crazy. He can say I'm wrong. I stole money from him. You know, to me, the lead singer, the lead guitar player, and the drummer of a band want to continue playing as the dictators NYC, not the dictators, but people, some people will call us the dictators. And he's taking that as though, you know, we're going against him and he's using his mommy's money you that she left him. 
He can go fuck himself. You guys all grew up together, and you're all in your 60s. No. Oh, you didn't no. know? No. No. We, we, I grew up with Scott since the fourth grade. We met Ross like and Andy around high school and college, like end of high school, early college, and um, that's it. Like everybody else, you know, nobody else was in the band that long. And we're all in our 60s, yes. But you all went through the trenches together. You all, you've all known each other since the 70s. I mean, I mean you're pretty much family. Don't you think it, that it, in your 60s that a bunch of guys in their 60s fighting over something so trivial, don't you think that it, it would seem that everybody would just say, look, man, we're, we're all grown-ups. Why can't we just be brothers and love each other and just let us all make a living? What are you, a fucking hippie? Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you don't have to literally love each first other. Of all, you... First of all, longevity does not make a family. Yeah, I okay? know, but... Longevity does not make a relationship. I have two first cousins. One was about 73, one was about 70. You can't stand them. They can't <laughs> stomach each other. Right. Well, you know? okay, I guess... It's I... like, why, why don't you change that? Why don't you change that? Because there are... The, the answer is kind of easy. It's like there are situations that cannot be worked out, and there are situations that can be worked out, and there are situations that don't want to be worked out or don't want to put that. Listen, okay, let me put the let, let, let me put this on you. All right. Okay. I lost I lost the best job I ever had in my life. I on, supported my family on underground garage, four, Little Stevens underground 14 garage. Fourteen years. Five five nights a week, national Which, show. I want to find out. Years. I want to find out the details of that too. But go ahead. All right. I broke up with my woman of eighteen years, and we have a child who's sixteen years. Yeah, yeah. I went to jail. In the in the following year of those three things happening and working themselves out eventually, and settling in eventually, not one person, Ross. JP, uh, not Dean, Dean called me, um, or Daniel, called me on the phone, sent me a text message, or emailed me to say, what's up, how you doing? People I've known all these years that I've just been on the road with for the last six years, not one call. Not and even to show not what even a liar Ross is, what a fucking liar oh. Ross is. Wow. He calls me one day. And I go, what, what the fuck is wrong with you? you? You know what I went through for the last year? How do you have the balls not to even get through? He goes, I tried to call you three times. I tried to, you, you didn't ask. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got 4,000 emails this year, 4,000 phone calls, and 4,000 text messages. You called me three times, but none of the three came through. But today, it came through because you called me to talk about the money that we should split up among the band that's owed. Huh. It's about money. <clears throat> and today, you happen to get through. That's why you're a full of shit liar. You know, you know what and that probably is? So I'm a, would you be friends with those guys? After that, would you say, hey, what's up with you guys? No, I, I get went through it. the worst year of my life. How I come you it. didn't call me? I get it. You know what it probably is? Because with all the Me Too stuff, and they figured you were involved in the domestic um, case, and, and, and you uh, allegedly quote laid a hand on on a woman or something like that they probably figured they didn't want to get caught up in any hold on hold on <laughs> no, so no, so everybody read this a story that said allegedly on day one but two months later nobody reads that it turned into the equivalent of, in right. my lawyer's word quote unquote a parking i ticket. heard that on the pod i was gonna do a it was a parking ticket. I heard that. That's on what your, I got. I heard that on your podcast. You want to tell? You want to tell it to uh, friends of the Rock and Roll Geek Show, or you? Mean yes, yes. I had a lawyer from the neighborhood who's hardcore East Village, hundred years. His grandfather and father lived in the neighborhood. His son played with my son in the playground. He's a defense attorney. I had him on my podcast because he's so fascinating. His story is amazing. If you if you listen to my podcast, I listen. I love the. You podcast. don't know. You don't know about Dick. You don't know. Re- Dick. Listen to the. Listen to the lawyer one. It's great. I listen to it. It's great. 
Okay, so his he looked at the case, and the first thing he said is, "Richard, this is total bullshit. This is to- like I was going to call it to me instead of me too. <laughs> I was going to call it to me. I mean, it, it, what, what, no, what, what people didn't know that morning, right? <clears throat> if you want, if you want to fucking hear it, yeah, I want to hear it. I've heard, I, hear it. I've heard but, it, but I want other people, people to hear it. Yeah. My she came home drunk, yeah. and my fourteen-year-old son said, "Mommy's not hungover; she's drunk." Yeah. And they got in a fight because he wasn't going to school in time, and she banged his head against the door. And I had to get up out of bed and say, "Don't you fucking hit him! Do not lay a hand on him." So then I go back to sleep. He goes to school. I wake up. She's got. She lost her cell phone, so you got to pay for your iPhone, like, like for two years. Right. If you lose it after four, she lost her cell phone drunk. Right. After five months. Yeah. So I have to pay it. And I'm paying it. Like, I worked for 18 years, and she worked zero. And I'm paying it. So I see her. I know she's going to, I know she's having an affair for three years with this guy, and some shitty writer in the West Coast. And, uh, and she thinks he's, a, you know, I mean, look, she basically crawled to him. She's like a slave to him because she thinks he's the greatest writer in the world. Whatever. It doesn't matter your anymore. Your girlfriend's cheating on What right? matters? Is she your wife or girlfriend? Is, what? Was she your wife or your girlfriend? No, she was my girlfriend, girlfriend. and my baby mom. Right, you get the the you mother know. of your child. No, we we lived together seventeen years. Yeah, okay. She's more or less your okay. wife then. What? More or less your wife? Pretty much your wife, just not married. No, well, it's not, but it's not my wife. We we never right. decided to get right. married. Exactly. In New York State, New York's different than California. Yeah. There's no such thing, <laughs> right? Unless you're married. So anyway, you've been with this woman forever. She's been cheating on you. you so I see four hundred dollars sticking out of her boyfriend's book. So I take two hundred of the four hundred. <laughs> I said, I said, listen, I'm still paying thirty eight dollars a month for another like for this, six months for this eight phone, months for your iPhone. If you give me two hundred bucks. If you give me two hundred bucks, that'll pay for a bunch of it. Now you're not working, and you said you wanted to chip into the family, and she goes, give me the money. I go, but this is like, it helped the family. She goes, give me the fucking money. She gets in my face. I go, no, I'm not giving you the money. Why should I have to keep paying and working and paying like you lost your phone and you won't give me some of this money sticking out of your boyfriend's book? <laughs> and, and she wound up, and she's five foot eight, 145 pounds, uh-huh. and she wound up with big hands. Her hands are bigger than mine. She wound up with hands. And when I say wound up, it's like, like she pulled her arm all the way back and smashed me in the ear, and then smashed me in the other ear, then smashed me in the other ear, smashed me in the other six times, three times, wound up smashing me in the ear, so I just bit her nose, <laughs> right? I don't know why, I just did bit her you, nose. Did you draw and blood? And then I pushed, her, I pushed her back, which she said, I stopped her breathing, I inhibited her breathing. I pushed her back, like I, I didn't grab her throat with two hands, I didn't grab her throat around her throat like in press, what I did is made like a U and push her throat back to get her body right, away from yeah, me. Right. And what and, 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 and she never went to the doctor. She never went to the hospital. There's no mark on her nose. I get arrested. I gotta go through the system. I gotta go to, to, to the tombs. I gotta be taken out of the house I own for ninety three days. I gotta deal with the fact that I can't even tell you the last thing that she did that got her out of here. You know what it is? I, I can't even tell you because it's so horrible. I can't even tell you. But she did, like, um, there is articles. You read, read what you want in the articles. There's somebody, what, they interviewed her girlfriend. And her girlfriend said, everyone knows Richard goes through her stuff and, and is jealous and goes through her stuff. And, um, and one of the questions I ask people on my podcast is, is it okay to go through your mate's stuff personal stuff or not and everyone automatically says no and i said okay let me ask you this question is it okay for a cop to stop a car if he sees two pounds of cocaine in the back window of a car and that's i forget what you call that's like right you know probable, you're allowed cause. To. probable cause probable cause if you know that your, your wife, mate your has been with other men a bunch of times if you know that a whole bunch of million other things that you found, you heard, you saw, it's like 5,000 examples. 
would that be probable cause? Because my attitude is yes. My attitude is you can live any life you want, but if you're going to live with me and our son, I want to have, I want to be able to say, go ahead, do that. Do whatever you want. I just want to be with you. Or, hey, if you're going to do that, I'm out of here, right? I want to have that. If you hide everything from me, you're living that secret life, and I don't have anything to say. So what happened was I get a phone call, the best phone call in the world. I said, let me get my coffee because my lawyer was, good news, Richard, we win. That was his word. That's your lawyer. And I, my lawyer. Yeah, this fucking killer lawyer. And uh, and she's like, you are a great lawyer. I said, what do you, what do you mean I'm a great lawyer? I'm the guy from the neighborhood. I mean, what do you think, I'm O.J. Simpson? Oh, yeah. I had a nine-lawyer team. Um, he said it was a bullshit case. It's like, like he, he told them who she is and what she's done in her life. And it was like the district attorney and the, and the um, prosecuting attorney, believe me, uh, didn't want they say, listen, we're not making a big case out of this, not, not with what she's done in the court. You know, they talk. They talk. The lawyer talks to them. So anyway, the good news was you're going to go to court and plead guilty, and people never get this right. You're going to plead guilty to um, disorderly conduct, and people go, oh, it's a misdemeanor. I go, no, it's not a misdemeanor. Parking a misdemeanor thing. is it's a an crime. Infraction. My, my, lawyer's, my lawyer's goal was to not have a crime on my record. Miss, um, what did I just say? Dis disorderly conduct in New York is the equivalent of two guys in a bar screaming or walking down the street screaming with a, with a bottle of yeah, beer, making noise. The cops pull them over and give them a ticket. Now, if any policeman in America says to me, have you ever been convicted of a crime? The truthful answer and the record will show is no. So after all this bullshit, <laughs> they, they, I, I'm convicted of a, a parking right. ticket, as he called it. You get a, it's called it's, you know what it's called a violation. Right. That's, That's what I'm convicted of. Of it's nothing. And so all her bullshit was bullshit. All her friends, you know, when her friends made up that I'm so jealous that I looked at her phone and found stuff on it and blamed it on her son. Now, you know what the truth is? My 13-year-old son found dirty, disgusting shit on his mother's phone that she was sending to other men. Well, okay? To tie this into baseball, the Giants... I don't, know if that should, I don't know if I should put that out there. I could maybe get in trouble for that. Uh, to tie it into baseball, um, the Giants... So you don't think that, that someone knows who she is saying that? Nah, nobody. But you didn't, my son, you didn't mention But wait a minute. Wait, my my lawyer always told me if it's the truth and it can be proved, you know, then it's the truth and it can be proved. But anyway, it's that's what happened. And he also said to me, "You should have got rid of her a few years ago." And you know what? I'm such a lunatic. I am totally bringing up my son. A guy who wakes up at noon all his life is waking up at seven to make breakfast to make sure my son takes his medicine. I took him to every doctor's appointment, every everything. Did you have to go through a custody battle to get your son? Your son's 16? Not, not at all. He even said, and I quote, Dad, if you have to go to court, first of all, I got, I, again, I forget, I forget words, uh, affidavits. Right. I got affidavits. I can't even tell you how many uh, from, from where. Guys who run schools, 800 ch children's schools, a, a fire department down the block a 29-year retired New York City detective, uh, an ear, nose, and throat surgeon, um, um, a couple of lawyers, friends of mine, um, all writing all this stuff. But it wouldn't go. First of all, the, my lawyer said, listen, that's going to be years, and, it, and it's going to be like a lot of money. And you know what he said? My son, if I go in that room with the lawyer, which is a 6, 15-year-old, they send you in the room with a lawyer, um... If I go in the room with him, I don't... Oh, shit. Uh, sorry. Um, if I go in the room with him and he tells me I got to live with mom, I'm just saying I'm not. I'll run away from home. I'm living with you, Dad. So your wife... Or, so said, the girlfriend was... Okay. And he said, you got to... And he said, and he said, 
you should have got rid of mom three years ago. Yeah. You're soft. That's yeah. what my son told me. Yeah. Well, you want to keep the family together, you know, keep the mom and dad, the both mother and father figure to raise the kid. I can Well, there is that. no family together. She's living in the West Coast. No, I mean, no, at the time, you know, in the three years that you stayed together, when you should have got rid of her, you want to, you stay together because you want to raise your son with a mother and father. I wanted to. And yeah, she exactly. wanted to be a child. And, exactly. And, and, you know, get high when she wanted to and screw around when she wanted to and, and I, you know, it was killing me, and yeah, and, and it was, you know, I, and I should have left earlier, and I'm investigating why I didn't. You know, it's like I'm I'm the woman in the situation that you always hear about that stays too long with with a bad man. You yeah. know what I mean? Do you go to a psychiatrist? What? Do you go to a shrink? Me? Yeah. Yeah, I I go to I have a, a pill pusher shrink. And I have a, a psycho I love psychology. I, I go to a psychologist, and I make my son. He's got a great shrink that he goes to once in a while, not not all the time. And uh, and he he goes to a great private school that that's half academic and half clinical with three on premises psychologists. So it's it's great. We're we're covering ourselves. These are things I believe in. Yeah. Do you, do you ever think in your life that handsome Dick Manitoba would go to a psychiatrist? Oh, I've I, I I've loved it. I've loved it. Are you kidding? Uh, over thirty five years. Oh, really? I'm, I, well, I make Woody Allen look huh. like uh, he's never gone before. <laughs> but I, when I got I got clean and sober in nineteen eighty three, uh -huh. and if not for the combination of psychoanalysis with what, what the sobriety is about with the 12 steps, it's not for the combination of the two. I don't think it would have worked because I can't stand in that room full of people and say everything, but I could go lay down on a couch and say everything to somebody I trust and believe in. I really believe there's, there's, there's nourishment in, in talking to the right person. Well, I guess back to the original thing, I guess the reason the guys in the band... And, you know, dictators, NYC and all that, you guys don't speak. Maybe they figured they didn't want to get involved in the Me Too stuff, and they thought this was like a Me Too thing. But, dude, but, dude, it, it stopped being a Me Too thing a year ago. Oh, I, I'm, I'm on it, your it, side. I'm on, I, I totally agree with you. I'm just trying to, I'm just thinking, you know, maybe that's what they think. If well, I, I lost my job. I went to jail. And you went through a tough how time. Come De yeah, where's how come your Dean friends? called me up? Yeah, where's your friends? Dean. But Dean called me up. We had to lunch three times already. How you doing? He keeps in touch. You know, wait, wait a minute. Hold is, on. Is, is you have to, is, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. It's, it's, you know, it's a thought. It's not a stupid thought. It's something. But Dean sends me... An email says, how are you doing? Is Dean... What does it have to do with me, too? Yeah, Dean is Daniel Ray, right? Is no, that... Dean is the bass player with the big hair. Oh, oh, okay, right, yeah, the bass player, yeah. And so, so, so how are you doing, Richard, is, is not involving them in me, too, exactly. Right. Because well, I would actually tell them what happened, that I got a parking ticket. Yeah. I'm just trying but to. He, I'm just trying to wonder why Ross the Boss, who you played in a band with forever, and uh, JP Patterson, who you played in a band with forever. Mm, when, JP, why, JP, I, I never liked him very much. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I just, I just, he's an amazing rock and roll drummer. I, I always, we always, well, uh, some of the guys in the band like him um, a lot more than I do, but uh, we, we never got along great. But sometimes you got along okay. Um, did, did, it's tough sometimes to be on the road when you're sober and the other person isn't. Did the Dictators tour with Kiss? A few shows. Did I heard that you made fun of Paul Paul Stanley and got thrown off the tour? It's absolutely true. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> what happened there? Well, um. After a show or two, I don't, I don't remember. It's hard to remember details. But after a little while, we'd watch Kiss every night. I'd watch Paul Stanley basically fill in the blank yeah, of he the would city do funny. they were playing he in. Say funny by shit. saying something like, "I hear Cleveland right. is a hot rock and roll right. town. Yeah. I hear Des Moines. How y'all so doing I tonight? Going, oh my god! 
I'm never <laughs> gonna be a big rock star. That's yeah. so fucking yeah. dumb. Phony. I can't do it's that phony. every night. It's not real. It's phony. So what? It's phony. It's it's fake. It, yeah. So it's like so. One night I got up. And we were in, <laughs> let's say Davenport, Iowa, and I hear I hear Davenport is a hot rock and roll town, and they went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got thrown up the floor. Huh. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> was uh, was that during the was that the uh, Manifest Destiny tour back in that time with with Animal Mendoza in the band? Jesus, you know what? I don't. I don't I, that, that's two questions. That, that's two questions about memory that I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, did but Mark in the band at that time? I don't remember. Mark's longevity, to tell you the truth, he was great. He's a great guy. And uh, did you guys? I tour? don't rem. Yeah. Did you guys tour with ACDC too? Yeah, we did a few shows with them. They loved us. We loved them. We we toured with Bon Scott. Man, yeah. that's a great. That's a great band. Yeah. That is one yeah. great band, yeah. and I'm proud to say that we know that they loved us. Yeah, I imagine everybody loved the Dictators. I know I did. Did you know Wendy O? No, I might have run into him once or twice, okay. but um, the guy who invented, who helped put together the plasmatics with her, um, what was his name? The plasmatics. Uh, he did this thing called the Ms. All Bear America pageant, which is like a naked pageant in the Beacon Theater. And the dictators came up from the basement on a riser to the, to the stage playing a heavy metal version of America the Beautiful. <laughs> and um, we, had, we had Don Imus was the host, and uh -huh. Henny Youngman was the comedian. Uh -huh. And these girls would get you know in, interviewed like, like a beauty, beauty pageant. Right. And... Uh, Oh shit, Mike! Can I can I put you on hold? Is that good? Yeah, that's fine. My son, uh, son's on the on the line. Okay, I'll hold I'll, on. I'll pause it. Yeah. Um. ACDC. What else? So what happened with the? So you had the um, Little Stevens Underground Garage radio show for how many years? Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. And I missed. I missed none. I didn't miss one show, five shows, five shows a week, 14 years. I didn't miss one show except for when um, um, my baby mommy, I came home from playing a tour in Europe, and like 18 shows in 19 days. And um, Did you do the I show from home, Europe? And I got home early enough to go run and do the show. Okay. I, I, I got home at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I could have got up there at six or seven, done the show, and never missed one show in fourteen years. But because she told me to stay home and rest, I missed that one show in fourteen years. And you got fired. That was for uh, that? serious, serious. A fun, eighteen shows in nineteen days in Spain. That's heaven to me. Yeah. So what happened with why is uh, your show still not on Sirius? Um, it's another person, like, sometimes, like, look, I don't know why Andy is Andy. I don't know why little Steven is little Steven. Like, like if I was writing a book, I, I would, I'd be writing a book, like, the first half of the book is he's the greatest, most giving, most, just most wonderful human being I've ever known. The second half of the book is the guy is, is, a, is completely perplexing to me, and I don't understand why the things that went wrong, according to me, are so severe that he would cut off a 40-year relationship, here we go again, and never talk to me again, and completely wipe out my entire living. Huh. And so I understand why he sold the bar. He was the main owner of the bar. The bar was losing money. Manitoba. So he, was him, a, he was a major investor, and in, he was a ma one of the owners of Manitoba's. The main owner. Main but owner, I, okay. he, saved, he saved the bar. I thank him for doing that. He, he didn't have to put up money. It was bar was made money, lost money, made money, lost it, but it never really made money. It was too small of a bar, but it was a great bar. People loved it. Yeah, I was in there. He, he wanted to put it on the market, 
I understand. He don't want to lose any more money. Right. The thing is, the show, I mean, I don't know. It seemed to me like every year he got mad at me for something different after being an amazing friend and an amazing, wonderful guy. But then I did something I wasn't supposed to do. Which was what? I think that, which was after I drew a Jewish star on this girl's desk who was Palestinian, because she had like a hundred Palestinian things all over. So I drew a star of David like about an inch big on the side of her, her desk. And uh, I was told I'm fired by Sirius. Oh, and, then, and then Steve said, we're going to tell everybody Richard is following his musical career. Hmm. And then I emailed him three times saying, please, let's talk, Steve. I, 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 it doesn't make sense. I've been playing for six years in a row. I have an, I, I, I'm working on my first solo album. No one's going to believe it. I'm already getting emails saying, what do you mean you're following your musical career? You never stop following your musical career. I said, Steve, please. The thing was, everybody's attitude was, look, the guy fucking saved your bar. He told you what to do. He's the boss. He doesn't have to answer your emails back. He told you what to do. You didn't do it. I went online, talked about the Jewish store, and he fired me. And he, he fired me like, he was like, you're out. You're completely like, like I was fired anyway. Wow. He said, I spent three days fighting for you, trying to get you back, and I couldn't. But now you went online with that, and now he, he called me like these names, and he completely turned like, like, hmm. like to me, I, I to, to me, yeah, to, to me, I feel like to me, this is my feeling. Yeah, like I did like twenty years in jail for an ounce of pot, you know, like, but people who are on Stephen's side forget the bar. I'll never not be grateful that he did that. The job was a great, great job. Paid well, national radio show, handsome Dick Manitoba. But, but the problem is, the problem is, it, 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 if I give you a great job and you do a great job and own the station or I own the bar and you're a great bartender, we're doing each other a favor. That was not a, that was a, that was not a favor. That was like a trade-off. So, like, to me, so, okay, so everybody else, it would be like, you should have just shut the fuck up. If he said, Richie, shut the fuck up. Just do what I say. Stop sending me your email. Okay, so that's his way of putting it. He's the boss. He wins. He always wins. He's the boss. But my way of looking at it, because I do have a way of looking at it. I'm a 64-year-old man. Reaching out to my friend of 40 years yeah. to please get back in touch with me. I need to tell me to go fuck myself and do what you say or what else do you want to think about? So I didn't get that. I got nothing. And then I got a lawyer friend of mine to call up Sirius three times. And Sirius said, Richard should come back and work for Sirius Satellite Radio. But he could only work for Stephen Station. And Stephen said, no way. And that was the last I heard from him. Huh. Did the bar so the bar got shut down before you got fired? I tell you from what Sirius? else. I tell you what else. I think this this is not a fact. I think I made more money. As a matter of fact, I know I made more money than one guy who's there now, who's like bigger than me and who's done more than me. So if I'm making more than him, he's got to be making more than everyone else. I think people are working for peanuts there. A oh, problem. Just to like be so, there. So many people. Have their there. name there. Kiss his ass. And I made really good money. I mean, ninety percent of my social security next year is going to be for that job. Uh -huh. So fuck it. So, did you get fired from Sirius before Manitoba's closed or after? The Manitoba's closed like two weeks ago. Oh, so that so he was still he was he was still one of the owners after he after he fired you and refused to talk to you. Yeah, but ten months ago he said put it on the market. Oh. Nobody wanted to buy it. So somebody bought it two two weeks or no, dead. I got all the pictures off the wall. Wow, you know a lot of people went came from all over the world to go to that bar. Look, don't make me sad, man. <laughs> I'm pretty sad about that. I went to that bar. I sat there and looked at at pictures on the wall, hoping that I would see you walk into that place. I live two blocks away. You know what it's like. I'm sitting here on my couch watching the baseball game. I would walk out of my door, walk two blocks. Um, and hang out with like four or five friends watching the Yankee game, you know, my clubhouse. 
Yeah, I a- lost my clubhouse. I'm very sad about it. Yeah, it was a cool neighborhood bar. So you're not um, doing anything for money now. You're just living off Social Security? No, I'm not taking Social Security yet. Well, how so are you I'm getting, 66. How are you getting money? Then it's like, what? How are, you, how are you collecting money? I saved up. I, I, well, I did some smart things. Like, let's say my highest bill is uh, $1,000, right? Let's just say. Every three months for, for my son's uh, life insurance. I paid a year in advance. Um, uh, I don't have to pay rent until October. My rent is very cheap. It's what it's, it, I don't want to get into. It's just very yeah, cheap. Right. It's what's called Mitchell Lama Co-op. Mitchell Lama started in 1964. It's a government subsidized co-op. It's not a co-op I could sell for like five hundred thousand dollars. This co-op would be worth one point five million if I could sell it. Um, so my rent is that cheap. It's like 1970s rent. Um, so my rent is very cheap. I have my son's life insurance paid for. I'm a couple of months ahead in my rent. And the rest is like, you know, food and, you know, cell phone and this and that. So what, what I'm, I have a few things. I'm about to sign a record deal and have my solo record out probably in the next, I'll probably sign the deal in the next two weeks. Probably put the record out in November, December. What label? Um, Do you know I'm what rather, label? I'd rather not talk about it. Okay, I don't want to jinx it. it. I, don't it I don't way. understand. I understand. It's a boutique label. It's a boutique label. It's a small label, but it's one of my favorite labels of all time. Has anybody so, heard the new music? Uh, some people, yeah. Do you want? I, I send out some. I'll send you. Yeah, what do you want? A couple of songs? Uh, would it be okay if I played one of the songs on this episode? I, I gotta ask my partner. He's really very, okay. all right. Like he's very opinionated about that. And I always like sort of yield because he's he's been such an insider in terms of of records and deals and and you know he, he's worked on sixty albums in his life. Well, know? I'd like to hear it so anyway. Had, yeah, l- let me ask him. Uh, you are playing on your podcast? Yeah, I would like to, if possible. Yeah, what I would send you is one sort of um, um, sort of real, really like sweetie pie melodic stuff. One that I wrote about a girl I fell in love with up in the country, up in the uh, Catskill Mountains when I was when I was eight years old. Uh-huh. I, I always have to say that right. like, she's eight years old. Wait a minute, I was right. eight years old too. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it starts the album off. It's called Shelley. Um, we have this song called Born in the Bronx. I could send you that one because okay. that's the name of the album. And then one I could call you is uh, is um, uh, the song about heroin. Uh, what's it called? It's so, uh, uh, you told you the said, cooker. It's called the cooker and the spoon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I heard you but talking about if that. If you on play the- it, Go if ahead. you play it, you got to play. You got to. Um, I can do only... something like read the words first, then play it. Okay, I'll do that. Or I'll only play half something of like it or that. whatever. Yeah, anything. It's fine. Well, that's, 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 all, that's what I did on the record. That's, that's all I did on the I record. I can't wait to so hear it. That's not going to make it. No, I'm sorry. That's not going to make a lot of money. It'll make a couple of bucks. So I just put something out online saying, like, hey, man, I'm looking for some creative work. You know, I don't want to, like, I could get a job delivering mail for like eight, six months or a year just to like get me over the top, you know, to, to, you know, I need that solid chunk. Like I'm going to have a small chunk starting in January when I turn 66 and then I just, you know, you know what I mean? Like I add like a little on here, like two little jobs and then you add it to that. And, you could all, um, you could also help. ask for donations on the podcast, you know, ask for listeners, Hey, if you like this show, send me a donation, send me 20 bucks. You know, if you, if you think this show has any value to you, because I, I, a lot of pie, my show survives on donations, and you're a lot more famous. Handsome Dick Manitoba is a lot more famous than Michael Butler. And if I make what I'm making on my podcast, you could you be making. I mean, just from donations, you could make some money. How do you? 
I have a pay- How do you I have a get uh, them? I have a PayPal link on my website. I have a, a thing called Patreon, which is what most podcasters do have Patreon. I know Patreon, yeah. And they and you know, say, Hey, if you like the show, and you know, this show this show ain't free. I need to I gotta pay my hosting and blah blah blah. I gotta pay my Libsyn costs or whatever and my website. Send me some money if you like the show. Just throw me a couple of bucks and be surprised. People will throw you a couple of bucks. They throw me more than a couple. And if I can do it. Really? And so you mainly use Patreon? Uh, I have Patreon. I have PayPal. One guy, I was playing a gig down in L.A. last week. A guy walked up to me at our gig and said, hey, man, I'll listen to your show. Here's 100 bucks." <laughs> he handed me 100 bucks cash. Um. <laughs> See that's that, that that's uh that's all paper trail now. Yeah, you know you make you you. I'm just saying if you, there's that those are ways you can make some money. I mean, you know. Yeah. Well, that I'm gonna have to pick your brain after we get done with the other stuff. Get it, I gotta get those MP4s to MP3. Yeah, I'll show you how to do that. <laughs> A couple yeah. more couple more so, questions and we'll wrap up this podcast. Okay. Whatever you want. All right. So. Uh, you lo- you were a big Robert Crumb fan. You were um, a fan of you're R. Crumb, like big fan. I right? think he's a, I think he's a genius. Here's a funny thing: uh, a friend of mine who I played in a band with works at the O'Farrell Theater in in San Francisco Strip Club, and there is a pen and ink drawing of R. Crumb that R. Crumb did on the wall upstairs in the office at the, at the O'Farrell Theater. It's about six feet tall that he did on Pen and Ink, and they're, start, they're trying to sell that building because of the same thing they're doing in New York, gentrification, turning everything into condos or whatever. And my friend is going to, when they sell the building, he's letting me go up there and cut off that, cut out that big piece of plaster, six-foot piece of plaster, an original R. Crumb um, drawing of like a couple of naked women. Doesn't he know how much it's worth? Uh, he knows how much it's worth, but the building, but the owners of the building don't know how much it's worth. They're just going to tear the building down. They're not going to, they're not going to try to salvage that R. Crumb drawing. They're just going to tear the building down and make condos. Wow. So anyway, I thought that would impress you. Maybe it does. You'll be know. rich. <laughs> uh, I'll hang it in my, in my house. I won't sell it. I'll hang it up. Cause I'm an R. Wow. Crumb fan. I'm an R. Crumb fan too. The boy howdy, um, logo is... You know, iconic. So, yeah, and I, I mean, that's one of the cultural things that we would come down from the Bronx, like 1969. You know, the Bronx would clo- staying in the Bronx would be like staying in the small town, yeah. like living outside of Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and like never really going into the big city. And staying in the Bronx, if we stayed there after nine at night, it shut down. There's nothing to do. So we'd come downtown and we would, you know, go to the Fillmore East and we'd go to the Electric Circus and we would go buy, you know, head shops and underground comic book shops and, and buy Zap Comics. And, you know, and just, I, I, I'm celebrating my 50th year of hanging out in this neighborhood. Like I, not hanging out, but. For a bunch of years, I hung out, and then I wound up living here. So I've been in this neighborhood for 50 years. When you were a kid, um, I don't know, when you were eight years old, when you fell in love with that eight-year-old girl that you wrote a song about, what did you want to be when you grew up? I never really knew. You didn't have I never any, really knew. It wasn't even even in your mind to be a singer in a rock and roll band. No, never, never. As a matter of fact, I'm tr- I'm so desperately trying to get my friend Richard Price, the great writer, to write some liner notes. I I, I have my own funny idea of liner notes, where uh, like you just said, so handsome Dick. When did you uh, ever? When when did you first decide you wanted to be a singer in a rock band? And my answer would be, I never wanted to be a singer in a rock band. So answer Dick, when did you decide you wanted to be on national radio? I never wanted to be on national radio. So answer Dick, so it goes along like this and goes along like this. And, and then it ends with, uh, with something funny. 
and then a quote by David Bowie, like make art. And then while you're, while they're busy deciding if it sucks or it's good, make more art. And that's basically what it is. Like it, I, it, there's no, it's one of those things in life. My story, that's why my story can't be told. My story, it's like people ask me, how do you do this? How do I get involved in this? I go, I have no idea. All I did was step in shit and then step in shit and then step in shit. And then I invented something and people responded to it and I took advantage of it. I want to think, I think when I was like, like 15 or no, 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 about 12, I wanted to be a psychologist. I like, I always was just intrigued by the human mind, the way it works, you know, and, and, uh, and how it doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, you, you wrote a, did you, you were going to write a play or a one man show. Is that written or just something? I was going to, I tell you what, man, it's an interesting thing. I had a talk with my shrink he, for the moment. He talked me out of it. It's a one man show based on what I wanted to do is have like a real potpourri of my life. I wanted to come out, walking back and forth across the stage, come out to, to some music, walking back and forth and telling like little five minute, seven minute funny stories, stopping and saying, you know what, let's have some live music now. Have the band come out, play like five or six songs, do like a half hour musical break, 20 minute musical break, and then have the centerpiece of the show, like a 20 minute story, half hour story of what happened with me and my old lady, ex old lady. Um, I wanted to have that and that was going to be called 93 days. It was the amount of time I spent, um, out of my house that I own. And then I had her served with papers to have to leave the house. And she said to me, I would never, ever throw you out of the house and not give you no money. And I just said, you know, you're a very, very good manipulator and then making people feel the way you want to make them feel. So here's the choice. We, the son, our son leaves the house. He wants to live with me. I own the house. I leave the house. Or you leave the house. Right? We can't stay together. We just built the volcano and the volcano erupted. And, uh, you know, she blamed me for everything and blamed me for driving her into another man's arms and all this bullshit. You know, it, the thing is, I think about it, I talk about it, I think about it. It doesn't matter anymore. It matters. It doesn't matter anymore. It's done. My son, he still loves his mother enough to go visit her in California. A few days here, a few days there a year. I'm sure she's really sad. Listen, she's a mother. She gave birth to the kid. She loves her son to death. And, you know, she sees him like 25 days a year. It's got to be eating her up, you know? So your psychiatrist and talked you out of doing a one-man show? The reason... He didn't talk me out of it. The way, that's not the way I look at it. I understand what, why you said that because of what I said. But what happened was, while I was talking to him about it, he said, if you're going to make the centerpiece of the show, the whole thing that happened with Zoe, you're bringing it up again. Instead of moving on, it's your album healthy. came out. Not All that healthy, stuff right. gets pushed back. Your other thing came out. All that stuff gets pushed back until eventually it's something like there's 25 things going on in right. your life. And that's like your 26 and 27. And if you're going to bring that front and center and make this, this whole incident and all this good, bad stuff and good stuff and bad stuff that went on in your life, the horrible stuff that hurts you every time you read it right. from Rolling Stone, all the lies and, and, and manipulations from somebody lived a life of that, it's, it's not, bad for you. It's not healthy. It's bad, you know, it's just bad. It's, it's bad well, for, your, for, your, for your handsome dick manitobaness. You know? What if you did a one-man show where that was only a small part of it and you showed a bunch of, you know, old 
footage from the old CBGB's days and Max's Kansas City days and, you know, old history of punk rock with the dictators forming and then you and Jane Counter or whatever, you and Iggy Pop, and made that just a part of the entire one-man show. And you just, you know, just went off the cuff and uh, did like a kind of like a uh, Mike Tyson, you know, how Mike Tyson did his, his one-man show kind of thing. What if you did something like that? I don't know. You know, a few reasons why it's on my chalkboard, as they call it, but on the bottom. Because that could make some money. And I, I don't. I don't think. I, I think. First of all, it's a new craft. It's not like you just get up here and do it. Like yeah, I've done talking. I've done telling stories. You know it's how to talk, though. Thing. What's that? You know how to talk. I mean, you can go. I could. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's I, still a different craft. Michael, it's still a different craft. Yeah, but you have a ton of charisma. You got a shitload of charisma. You know how to talk. Yes. You're an intelligent man. It's, but it's not radio. It's not rock and roll. It's not. You conquered bar. all those things. It's, it's, still a, it's still a different craft. You have to put your time in how to put it together, how to tie it together, how to be fluid. You have to have people on stage. You have to have lighting. You have to have people helping you. Um, I want to have a big screen behind me with stills. You can so do people it. You can laugh when I. You know, like, it's, it's, it's a lot more work than you think. And then you start in 50 seat theaters. And what are you going to do if you've never done it? You can charge $25. You have to charge $10, $12. It's $500, $600 to start with. It's a lot of work. You know, I, I can open a book. I'd rather do a book. A book, a book at least that will offer me twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, you know? You should do I, that, I too. Like eight, eight. What? You should do a book, too. Do a book and the one-man show and the solo album. All of it. <laughs> Can I borrow some of your money you make from your well, podcast? Well, yeah, I, I got Sure. <laughs> 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 hey, man, if I had the money, I'd finance it for sure. I'm not rich, but I would, you know, if... What if, I want to do, what I really want to do is get this record out so people can like or not like what I've come up with, which I'm proud of. And then I'm going to play some shows with a band, some shows here and there. Yeah. And then I want to keep building my podcast until it gets big enough that it's kind of big. And then after that, I could think about, you know, a book. Maybe a book would be good at that point because it'd be money. Somebody would be helping me do it. And uh, it might be fun. You know, at that point, like a couple of years and I'm older, I'm more tired. Yeah, I'm still high energy. <laughs> you did the MC5 thing for a while. Did when when Wayne Kramer came back this last year and did some and did an MC, some MC5 things with guest musicians. Did you play with that? Did you do, participate in that at all? No, I asked his wife, "What's up?" And she's like, "Oh, blah blah blah." You know that they wanted like big rock stars for this one. Yeah, oh, MC50. Okay. Um, you know, listen, I. I want to put it right. Um, I would like to have done it. I, I, I wish they would have asked me to do one or two songs. Who sang on it? Um, Who did the singing on it? I, I don't know. There's a bunch of rock stars that are in bands that... I'm not really up on the new bands that much, but yeah, they're, they're obviously very famous. But I, I don't know who they are. Wayne does. Yeah. But, you know, it's Wayne's trip. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne's the kind of guy who, like... You know, he'll call me to do something or or we'll connect on some level to do something together. Otherwise, like five years will go by, I won't hear from him. And uh, You had fun doing that MC5 thing, though, right? Oh, man. You know how I put it? What if somebody asked you, how would you like to travel around Europe for three weeks and get paid money to sing Kick Out the Jams? That would be like asking me... How would you like to travel around Europe and play Who Will Save Rock and Roll? Okay, fair enough. In other words, I wow. would fucking love Yankees it. Yankees just tied it up. Who just hit a home run <laughs> with one nothing? Yankees are losing one nothing. All right, well, Handsome Dick Manitoba, the legend. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. That's okay. Handsome Dick Manitoba, the legend, punk rock royalty, and uh, the greatest entertainer. What is it? What's the uh, what is the tagline? World's greatest entertainer. And the world's host, greatest entertainer. And host. Did Sammy Davis Jr. die? 
and host of the podcast called You Don't Know Dick, which, by the way, is a fucking great podcast. Everybody, please go subscribe to this thing because it's a great podcast. I'm not, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, Dick Manitoba. It is a great podcast. I love it. I, I appreciate it. I have listened it. to. I only. I've listened to every episode except for the latest. The, not the latest. I've. I listen to the latest, but not the. I'm up to Tom Morello. That's the one, the only one I have not fin- listened to yet. But um, go subscribe to it, friends. You don't know Dick. It's um, it's a great podcast. Handsome Dick Manitoba speaks from the heart, and there's no filter either. And it, that's what I like about it. So he's uh, it's um, Tom Morello's great. By the way, he is a great guy, great man. Well, I look forward to hearing that one too. Is uh, you still do the show now? Because you haven't, you have a bunch of episodes in the can that we haven't posted yet. Because I've been helping. I've been here. The little backstory. I've been helping um, handsome Dick Manitoba get this thing back going. So you have a bunch of shows in the can. Is your female co-host on the other episodes too? Uh, she's on some. And I, as a matter of fact, the first time I talked to her in about two months today, because we got so bogged down with bullshit, and uh, she's looking for like jobs herself. So um, I have my friend set up Monday. Well, he won't make it on for about a month because I got to catch up with this other thing. But uh, my my friend is 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 a great, great, fascinating, interesting guy. He just, he'll come in the bar, and I just listen to him talk. His name is Keith Elliott Greenberg. He's written about eight books. He uh, wrote scripts for the WWE, for Vince McMahon, for 20 years. Huh. He's the producer of American Most, American Most Wanted for 10 years. And um, he's just a fascinating guy. He's got just like endless stories. And he's very well-spoken. He's very bright. And I can't wait to have him on Monday. But uh, when it airs, God knows. You know, that. I don't have a lot to do with you. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm gonna. I'm going to help. I don't have a lot to do with you. <laughs> I'm gonna help you with all of them because I I want to see this thing succeed. So I'm in your corner, handsome Dick Manitoba. Thank you so much for coming on the Rock and Roll Geek Show. I really appreciate it, man. Man, you're great. It's my pleasure. You've been wonderful to me. And uh, anything I could do for you, you know, I I give back. All right. Thanks. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push stop on this record and then. Um, then I'll help you whatever you need me to help you, okay? Okay. All right. Well, there you go. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Handsome Dick Manitoba, the great Handsome Dick Manitoba. <sighs> Once again, his podcast is called You Don't Know Dick, available where fine podcasts are anywhere. And it's one of my, like I said, it's one of my favorite podcasts. I, I'm now looking forward to... Even though I'm helping him upload the episodes, I can't wait to, to, to help him upload a new one because I can't wait to listen to it at work or whenever I listen to a podcast. It's, it's very entertaining for me. The guy's got no filter, speaks from his heart, and it's probably the most honest, with the exception of the Rock and Roll Geek Show, it's probably one of the most honest podcasts out there. So I hope you, I hope you listen to it, friends. It's, uh, it's called... You don't know Dick, the handsome Dick Manitoba podcast. All right. I'm going to close out with a song nobody has ever heard, ever. Handsome Dick Manitoba solo music. I didn't think he was going to send me this stuff. He said he would on the sh- when I interviewed him. And I said, well, should I, should I ask him for these songs? I mean, am I putting him out by asking him? So I, I said, fuck it. So I sent him a... a Here's an Eddie Trunk thing coming again. I texted Handsome Dick today at work. I can't believe I said that. I texted Handsome Dick and said, Hey, uh, just asking if you could send me a song from your solo album to play on the show. And he sent me four. And he sent me all the lyrics of these songs because the lyrics are very important in his songs. He speaks from the heart, and this is these songs are extremely honest. Quite a quite a departure from the dictators, but I would say they're more of like if Handsome Dick was was doing Bruce Springsteen. I guess this is this you could say is this is Handsome Dick Manitoba's Bruce Springsteen um, stuff. I don't know what that means, but. It's a departure from the dictators, but I love it because it's so heartfelt and. You can just tell he is speaking 
from a deep place, and I like it. So what I'm going to play for you is a song called Cooker and the Hit, which obviously I'll, I'll, I'll read you a little bit of the lyrics because the lyrics are obviously very important to Handsome Dick Manitoba. Coming out of my room, I got a bad head start, yet I lived long enough to break five of my hearts. I broke every damn rule the playground had, got thrown out of school, should have been a grad. Reminds me a little bit of Dee Dee Ramone, actually. He has a lot of Didi Ramon qualities, I think. And Didi Ramon, genius. You don't need me to tell you that. I never did live by the golden rule. Made me the least liked kid in school. When I had to get, when I tried to get a job, it was the same old thing. Black sheep's among us. Got nothing for you, kid. While my mates were spearminting with their hippie bullshit, I was falling in love with the cooker and the hit. All right, here you go, friends. Cooker and the Hit, thank you for listening to the Rock and Roll Geek Show. Please keep the donations coming because without your donations, as you know, this show would die a horrible, putrid, stench-filled death. You can find this show at rockandrollgeek.com. You can send me an email. Let me know what you think, uh, thought of this. Send, go to handsomedickmanitoba.com. Send him a, an email. Let him know you heard about him on the Rock and Roll Geek Show so he doesn't think he wasted an hour and half of his time. And you can, like I said, you can find me on the Facebook r and Geek. Find me on the Twitter r and Geek. Find me on the Instagram Rock and Roll Geek. Don't ask. All right, that's enough of me, of me yapping. Here's Handsome Dick, Manitoba, Solo, Cooker, and The Hit. We'll talk to you soon. Coming out of my mom, I got a bad head start. Yeah.
It's a rock and roll geek train wreck. <laughs>